Well, here we are. Peter McAleese, part two. And no mean soldier. We've talked about how that um, name of the book came about. Let me just show you quickly. It's very difficult to get it smack in the middle because of the light. Peter McAleese, no mean soldier. There it goes. You have to get the book, guys, to get the full stories. The book is being, um, as we say, rewritten to some degree, and it will be out three to four weeks. It's a must-buy. Okay? It's done very well, and you can only learn the story from the story. And you learn the story from the master. So with that, Peter McAleese there. Say hi to the, to the troops, Peter. Hello, folks. How are you? They're well. I can hear them in the background applauding, mate. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's nice to get you back on here again. And obviously, you've been off the air for quite a long time. People are waiting to hear the stories. I know that. I'm keeping an eye on social media and what's going on. They can't wait. And even I am getting new stories as we go along really enjoy it so the film killing escobar i mentioned today to get onto our facebook page i'm not going to go through all that again but um you know the story itself is a little part in peter's book but it looks like it's going to be a big film from a little part it just shows you nobody knows what's around the corner as much as you plan and prepare don't forget the what ifs. We've mentioned all this before. What if? What if? Well, there is no what if here. 7th to the 10th of March, pay per view. Get the details. I'll certainly be watching it. And um, we all know Pablo Escobar is. And a very dangerous person. Now, Peter had a. 12-man hits team that were going to take him out. Things changed. You'll see it in the film. However, it's now years on from then and you get a chance to see it. The operation that was going to take place was called Operation Phoenix. It did take place and then there was one or two things. A what if? And the what ifs are what we conquer. Two things, SAS, adaptability and flexibility. That's it. So as much as it was a small part of Peter's book, you're going to be able to see it in real time next week from Sunday for four days. Where it goes after that, I can only think to the top. I don't know. But I haven't been involved in the film I do know everything is possible. So, Peter, you decided against the Foreign Legion. Just recap on why your lucky meeting with a mate of yours changed your mind. That day you were off. Could have been a totally different story and we would never be sat here today. Um, I left Hereford and I was on my way to join the Foreign Legion. I stopped in London to see a friend of mine and I explained to him what I was going to do. And he said, uh, have you not thought about Rhodesia? I said, yes, sir. yes, I have, but I don't have the money to get there. So he said, I'll lend you the money. So um, two days later, I got myself on a plane and I flew out to Rhodesia. Uh, I arrived there. I made contact with some Brit SES guys that I knew and we had a chat and they smoothed me to the recruiting office where I was accepted into the Rhodesian SES. Um, I got there and what had happened by this time was the, the SES was recruiting from the RLI and other places uh, and the Rhodesian army and they decided We'd rather train our own guys from scratch. So I was um, 
I was put on a basic course of five months basic training. Uh, I then, at the end of it, I did the selection. And from there to the parachute school and into the actual unit itself. Uh, the difference, the British SS had uh, older, older chaps in it. The Rhodesian SES had young guys, you know, anywhere between 19, 18, 19, 20. Uh, some of them in the f finish up, some were, were taking conscripts. But in fairness to these kids, they really, they really done their own thing. Hello. And um, they really did their, their own thing and uh, they became good little SES soldiers, which proves you that you don't have to be an old man to go there. Because those, some of those kids, um, they actually perform marvellously, you know. Yeah, and that's what it's about, Peter. I mean, let's be yeah. honest, the Rosesians were, uh, as you said, and I've met quite a few, obviously, a great set of people, you know, and not only that, good soldiers, which is what you want around you, especially the type yeah. of work you do. You want to be able to put trust into people, no question. Oh, but, they, yeah, go, yeah carry the, on. Kids, the young men there were good. Uh, there were some guys, that the, the leader element within it had done quite a few years in the army. So, you know, um, you had younger guys, but the, the leader element had done maybe anywhere between 10, 10, 12 years, you know. So they were fairly switched on. Yeah. And as you say, in the type of business that you're in there and, you know, when you need trust and when you need, when the shit hits the fan, if you like, you've got to trust the people around you. And you can only get that feeling of trust, I think, when you work with them and train with them. But what well, about... Yeah, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, while we're talking about that, um, the training that you did um, when you said to get into the SAS itself, how did yeah. that compare with when you did the selection for 2-2 SAS? Was it similar but in a different country, if you like? Well, you know, um, I've been to Rhodesia, and, yeah. and I know, but the actual training itself... To yeah. get in, it was different, but to the same end. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did an awful lot of running there, um, and uh, a lot of marches with your packs and 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 whatnot. Um, that you know, and what they did is the preparation for um, selection was actually tied in with continuation training. Yeah, and uh, everything was done with live ammunition. It was fantastic. Uh, the, we had a training officer called Johnson, um, who was he he was good at organising exercises. He he actually kept the thing going with tons of momentum and and, and thrust. Yeah, and uh, and the instructors he had them just moving along and doing their thing, and the kids in general <laughs> really enjoyed it. Well. When I say kid, please excuse me there. I was the oldest man in the group. <laughs> Somebody has to be, Peter. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, you've come out of it uh, unscathed, mate, which uh, yeah. says you were still good at ducking and diving, mate. That's the main yeah. thing. But let's go on quickly then. Um, let's pick an operation, one that I read about um, called Operation Dingo, um, 1977. Um, November 23rd to the 25th. Um, I've spoken to you about this before, but, you know, the Rhodesian Special Forces, Security Forces versus Zandla in those days, you know, at the end of the battle, <laughs> um, the staggering statistics are that there was 3,000 dead Z-A-N-L-A -Z forces. There was 5,000 wounded but staggeringly enough, <laughs> that on the other side, your side, there was one pilot killed, one SAS died, and six wounded. Talk us through that from breakfast on the day you went out to do that operation. Yeah. The, the, the well, I think, I, I think the, fi the figures that you've just given could have been a wee bit exaggerated, but Possibly. let's carry on with it. Um, we had the most marvellous briefing that I've ever had in my life. It was it was full of energy. It was presented by a guy who I'll call him Brian, uh, the squadron commander. He was very forceful 
and he was backed up by the intelligence officer who was called Scotty. There was a, a model there, they'd been preparing it for ages. And it, it was delivered with so much passion and force that you actually felt you were there on the ground when they were delivering the set of orders. Um, and we went to, they said, okay, get away. And, you know, there was the senior NCOs and officers stayed behind and we carried on. The next morning, we got up, we had a sort of breakfast, the uh, RAF style, and um, we then moved over to the hangar to get kitted up. And I, you could feel the sense of purpose in the air. You know, everybody, you know, was helping everybody get their shoots on, helping me clip the kit on. Uh, even the sergeant majors were getting in there. They were really, everybody was doing their bit. And uh, and you could feel that you could feel the build up. The more kit we put, put on, you could feel the readiness passing through. You know, your body. And then we marched out to the um, to the aircraft, and they they. The number is off. We got into the aircraft and we took off and we flew into the Mozambique, 96 kilometers inside the Mozambique. And we went out there, out the aircraft. And the, on the briefing, they told us, you will step out the door at quarter to eight or 7.45 army time. Um, and sure as hell, as we flew over that target, we stepped out that door at 7.45. By this time, there was flight coming up and the pilots were really in control of the situation. The men were jumping out fairly fast. Um, but there was quite a bit of flack about But lucky enough, there was Canberra's and the um, fighter aircraft strafing the place at the time. So... It, it wasn't that accurate on the Dakota, so they managed to get all the paras out and we landed and we blocked the place off and then helicopters came in carrying the some RLI and they blocked off another area. So what we had was three quarters of a square with one 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 part left open, which the aircraft were coming. It, it was all down to the amount of men we had available. So we lay there. I, I landed in a, in, in a tree and I was kicking my way down and a chap opened fire on me and uh, I managed to get myself out my harness and uh, I got behind an anthill and I had a friend called Steve who said, uh, I've got him, I've got him. And I, I started firing, Steve started firing and the guy, the guy then tried to surrender. I had the click on his magazine and he just dropped dead. I think he had a couple of rounds in him already. Um, so we lay there for about an hour while everything was getting sorted out. There was strikes getting in, air strikes and uh, chopper strikes and gunships were all over the place. And then they say, stand up. And we started sweeping. And it was like, you know, we were just running into hundreds of them. Um, and it was, you know, we were just... It, it was intense. We were moving forward there, and every step we took, there was another guy there, guys hiding under bushes, guys taking their clothes off so as they, you know, they'd blend in with the bush. Um, and then we got to the centre of the camp, and um, there was fighting carrying on from there. And we had the whole lot wrapped up around about four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we then went into ambush positions because they all started coming back at night time shooting, no comrade, comrade. And they were running into our ambush positions all over the place. Um, so that carried on all night. We got up the next morning and it was the same thing again. We were searching out groups, running into them in, you know, in little dips in the ground and uh, there was firefights going on all over the place. Um, and it was, it was, it just went on relentlessly all the time. But you know, the the thing that got me about the whole thing was the amount of planning that had been put into the operation, which was about 18 months, I think, was the calibre of the men we'd put down. Don't forget, there was RLI paratroops there as well. 
an Aral light, a Rhodesian light infantry chopper troops, and uh, they were performing great, you know. Um, and then what we did was we started sweeping all the areas in the afternoon, and we were running into groups of people all over the place. Come, come the about four o'clock, we started pulling out, and we flew back to uh, Rhodesia. And we're all there getting ready to go to the pub, talk to each other about war, war stories. And everybody was all excited. There was a buzz on that, you know, what we'd actually done, how successful it had been. And the next thing we see is this way, chaps. And they locked us up in a fucking cage. <laughs> Peter, <laughs> Peter, uh, tremendous story. Now, we're going to carry on with this one in the next video, okay? Yeah. And then we're going to go into your last part of the 44th Para Brigade in South Africa and the Pathfinders. Yes. But unfortunately, on Zoom, you know, we, we do have time constrictions. And yeah. rather than try and race it through now, let's get part three in and we'll carry on and keep the um, audience enthralled, mate, because it, absolutely tremendous story, mate. So we're going to come back and do that one as the next one. Yeah. And I'm going to 